Medtronic Technologies impacted more than 72 million people in the last year, equating to two people every second. Harnessing the power of technology to take healthcare further, each technology has unique benefits designed to serve patients. The goal of this program is to get closer to the patient and to delve into the challenges and impact each technology has in practice. This is the Medtronic MedEd learning experience. The BIS monitoring system should not be used as the sole basis for diagnosis or therapy and is intended only as an adjunct in patient assessment. Reliance on BIS system alone for intraoperative anesthetic management is not recommended. Medtronic's medical education programs are offered to provide attendees education on the FDA-cleared indications and use of our products when applicable. The contents and conclusions of the following program are solely those of the speakers unless otherwise cited. The speakers are responsible for all content and any necessary permissions. The speakers received funding from Covidian LP, a Medtronic company, for the speaking engagement. For this segment of the series, a discussion on anesthesia and the brain, we will dive into why we might want to use processed EEG for anesthesia management. To help provide insight into this topic is Dr. Bob Thiele, Assistant Professor and Co-Director Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Program at the University of Virginia. If we accept that EEG and process EEG tell us something useful about the state of the brain under anesthesia, which I think is incontrovertible, it's absolutely true that we can get useful information about the brain from process EEG, why might we want to use that? And I think one of the first reasons is because everybody's different. And then we talked about that a little bit when I showed the slides that show how the EEG is affected differently based on your age. But this is a really nice paper. It's, it's almost 20 years old now, but just showing that like the plasma concentration of propofol, a standard anesthetic, can actually vary quite significantly in patients that are under the same depth of anesthesia. So you can have someone with a propofol concentration less than two micrograms per mil that's going into birth suppression. And you can have someone with a concentration of five mics per mil that's not unconscious, or at least not under general anesthesia. And that's a pretty wide range. This is some nice data looking at uh, pro the effect of propofol effects like concentration on BIS scores. And so this study, this group just started patients on a 110 milligrams per minute propofol infusion for five minutes and then turned it back down to a really low dose. And what they found is that the drop in the BIS score really correlated nicely with the predicted effects like concentration at the brain. And most interestingly on the right, what we saw is that blood flow to the brain actually was tracking very closely to BIS scores, which is not surprising. And we showed you this data earlier, suggesting that like brain metabolism is actually shut down as you go deeper and deeper into anesthesia as measured by EEG. And so unsurprisingly, the, the brain, which auto-regulates quite nicely, uh, doesn't need as much blood flow during general anesthesia. I think another useful sort of, um, purpose of process EEG is to try to understand the effect of different drugs that we use. You know, probably 20 or 30 years ago, most people were anesthetized with a volatile anesthetic agent and opioid, and that was it. We've got a lot of different drugs now, like dexmedetomidine and ketamine that we're using that also help contribute to general anesthesia, but, but create unique signatures on process EEG. And this is paper, or these, this set of papers is really looking at the effect of ketamine, which is something that we use more frequently now at the University of Virginia. And a lot of groups are because of its ability to blunt opioid-induced hyperalgesia and this new appreciation that um, opioids are not necessarily the best drug to be using as analgesic agents, at least by themselves. And so what we find is that during a probobet, propofol-based anesthetic, ketamine seems to reduce BIS scores in conjunction with the anesthetic depth, although it might spike temporarily if you give a bolus. But in patients that are using volatile anesthetic agents, the ketamine produces a paradoxical increase in BIS scores. And that's something that is important to understand if you use a lot of ketamine during volatile anesthetics, as we do where I work in our cardiac anesthetic cases. Now, I don't have a figure showing this, but there are actually you know, EEG signatures that ketamine produces at really pretty high frequencies. What problems do we actually need to solve and how might process EEG help us solve them? Well, uh, the, the big obvious one is intraoperative awareness and we'll talk about that, of course. 
other things that we worry about as anesthesiologists or CRNAs or in the ICU are post-operative nausea and vomiting, delirium and POCD, cognitive dysfunction, which is a huge problem now. I was part of a group, lucky to be part of a group that actually looked at some of the data on processed EEG in, for the reduction of intraoperative awareness and how we might use neuromonitoring to impre- in, impact meaningful clinical outcomes, which is not just intraoperative awareness, that being a very rare event. So when we look at the data on intraoperative awareness, there are really sort of three types of studies that have been conducted using process EEG. One is just the use of process EEG in total intravenous anesthesia. We talked at the beginning about this immobility paradigm, which is true and developed really with volatile anesthetic agents, the idea of MAC and immobility and spinal reflexes, but that's not necessarily the case for a propofol infusion. And so it's known that a total intravenous anesthetic is associated with a higher incidence of awareness. And process EEG has been studied in the setting of total intravenous anesthesia and absolutely process EEG reduces awareness in those cases. That's about 6,000 patients in two randomized controlled trials. Now process EEG has also been compared to routine anesthetic care using volatile anesthetic agents without alarm to end tidal anesthetic gases. And that's even more, there's even more data looking at process EEG in this scenario. So about 17,000 patients in five randomized controlled trials also showing that process EEG reduces intraoperative awareness in this scenario. The third scenario in which process EEG has been tested is comparing it to volatile anesthetic agent with alarmed and tidal anesthetic gases. And in those studies, there doesn't appear to be a difference in intraoperative awareness, either for, in favor or against process EEG. It performs the same as alarmed and tidal anesthetic gas. So postoperative nausea and vomiting, obviously it's much more common than intraoperative awareness, um, not as catastrophic, but something that people really care about if you actually ask your patients. And TJ Gann has been doing this research on different anti-emetic agents and strategies for preventing this for about two decades. And he published these guidelines a couple of years ago on the management of PONV in patients undergoing surgery. So a couple of things that this group came out with as a consensus, one is to use, if you're really trying to reduce the incidence of POMV, either because of a history of POMV or the type of surgical procedure would make POMV really problematic, particularly some GI surgeries, um, they advocate that you use propofol both for induction and maintenance of anesthesia. And you avoid nitrous oxide and volatile anesthetic agents. So basically, um, total intravenous anesthesia. In those scenarios, the data suggests that we should be using Bismonitor to minimize the risk of, or excuse me, bispectral, any process EEG, including bispectral index to minimize the risk of intraoperative awareness. Interesting, there weren't any benefits in the MAX trial. Uh, There was no reduction in PONV associated with the use of bispectral index, but that was a study using volatile anesthetic agents. And actually, in the outcomes of that study, they actually didn't find a reduction in anesthetic use, which would make sense that there wouldn't be a PONV difference, but this was a volatile anesthetic trial. So post-operative delirium, something that certainly is an intensivist is on my mind all the time. But now I think the public has increasingly started to appreciate that this is an issue, especially with older patients. And we don't know how much of this is causation versus association, but we know that patients who experience post-operative delirium have much worse outcomes than those who don't. And so there are now several studies, including four randomized controlled trials in patients undergoing general anesthesia with over 3,000 patients that suggest that the use of process EEG monitoring to titrate general anesthesia actually does reduce the incidence of postoperative delirium. So p- packaging all that data together, this perioperative quality institute that I was a part of it came up with 10 recommendations and you can look them up that reference there paper from 2020. I think the three most important ones, they were strong recommendations. 
are one that we, clinicians be knowledgeable in EEG interpretation when using this technology. So people used to criticize process EEG as a black box. And I don't think that's a fair um, description of how the technology is worked or perceived. It is a little bit more complicated than for instance, a blood pressure cuff, but it's not impossible to understand sort of the foundation of how these process EEGs um, numbers work, how they're produced, and how to interpret these waveforms. So we've gone over some of the examples of information that you can glean just by looking at the raw, raw waveform and the compressed spectral array. And I would argue that if you're going to use process EEG, you should get as much information as you can out of it. And that's 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 kind of a real estate problem now in the operating room in the ICU. You know, we have a lot of monitors and a lot of technology. And it's very tempting to get the little box that the process EG plugs into and just have the number show up on your screen so it doesn't distract you from some other number and, and there's just limited space to display information. But if you can actually get the full process EG display, there's a lot more information available than just the number which we talked about. And if you don't use that, then you're kind of in some sense wasting the monitor. This group also recommended the use of entitled anesthetic gas monitoring with alarms in patients who are undergoing general anesthesia under volatile anesthetic agents. And absolutely recommended the use of process AG in patients to reduce the risk of awareness in patients receiving total intravenous anesthesia. Please tune in next week for a new segment from this series wherever you find your podcast. This is the Medtronic MedEd Learning Experience. Thank you for listening.